Thank you, Marilis. Now we'll hear from Alternativa Socialista in Paraguay. Hello, everyone, comrades from the world. I'm very thankful for being able to participate once again. Um, so important for the building of an alternative and such as Joaquin from Chile, I wanted to um, greet the comrades who now remember the day of the Afro women and the black community and their fights. So I wanted to talk about the situation in education and work in Paraguay. Uh, it's a shame that we have to uh, uh, summarize our report, um, not to take too much time. So we will be publishing in our social media the full report of this intervention, if you would like to read it. In Paraguay, we as youth have been enduring for decades the lack of the opportunities, uh, working and educative opportunities. This system that oppresses us and tries to squeeze us out for businessmen to accumulate great quantities of money. Uh, our particular case, uh, 1 million 5,000 people are working informally and it's hard to have a specific number of those who work in factories and businesses. Uh, nowadays, there are extremely few places in which you can uh, sign a contract to have some guarantees. Uh, wages are even lower each time or cut under any excuse. And now the pandemic is worsening this situation. We have 3,000, um, 300,000 layoffs which keeps uh, low salaries and high um, and a high amount of hours in every shift. So in 2008, there, uh, the union movements were hit by the organizational uh, strategies. So uh, public investment also was also reduced. Uh, only to try to pay interests. The educative, educative sector was um, hardly hit that time. In 2015, the youth aroused and left a historic mark um, with, uh, with the claims that can be held until today of investment of 7% of the GPD. Uh, against the misery number of 2.7% in education. We are in the top five worst uh, educative systems of the world. In 2015, uh, the spring the student springs happened in which um, schools of all the world were occupied and that uh, resulted in the taking down of the education minister. And months later, almost the whole national university was occupied under the banner, uh, Asuncion university, National University, don't be silent. Um, that uh, resulted in the principal quitting, um, but we didn't want to stop there, but keep on with democratic reforms to change national university. This fight was uh, curved and disarticulated by um, leaderships of students which were allied to the regime parties uh, and therefore showing their class limitations. Uh, they weren't able to advance in a strong unity between students and workers. Nowadays, um, the reject towards the government uh, has generated a great crisis of the government. Uh, the whole government is actually accused or charged. Uh, they lack credibility. And since the since 22 of June, we have uh, different mobilizations, massive mobilization to protect though that that they want to take away from us. So we have a partial victories, which are very important. And yesterday for an important mobilization of unity among workers and students, we were able to uh, bring forward the project of 
zero tuition. Uh, we still have to discuss uh, where to get the money from. Um, we propose uh, there is need um, for that project. We need $35 million. So we propose to stop the payment of the external debt. Uh, this year, they have already paid $163 million only in interest. So that's where we have to take the money from to finance education, but not only that, but also uh, economy in a sustained and permanent manner. So uh, people, um, the bourgeoisie is um, joining in an only front. Uh, they are not fighting each other anymore. This is one of the first only fronts of the bourgeoisie. And we will keep on seeing them in the Senate and Congress. This new situation is developing in favor of the working class and the mobilized people. Uh, we have to mobilize, taking into account all sanitary measures, uh, so to not worsening the, the pandemic situations. Uh, so this government prefers the profits uh, over our lives. So this is why we build uh, Alternativa Socialista Paraguay. Thank you, comrades. We are uh, now uh, sending a message in the chat uh, with our social media so you can see the full report. Thank you, Juan. Now, Soledad from Peru. Hi, I hear you loudly. How are you, comrades, brothers and sisters? It is revitalizing to be able to hear each other in spite of the distance. I feel you close because we have a common enemy, a, an enemy that exploits us, that makes our lives difficult, that has lots of speeches, and an enemy that we have very well identified and is called capitalism. And against that capitalist enemy, we have to unite to struggle together because it attacks not only Peru or Latin America, but the entire world. Our brothers and sisters in Peru today is living one of its most dramatic hours. This is one of the darkest chapters of the history of Peru because it is the second country in Latin America the fifth country in the world in amount of cases of COVID-19. And it is, and there are 355,000 people infected and we are going on to 35,000 deaths already. There are- De los medios de comunicación, y otro es el Perú profundo. El Perú real, el Perú al que no quieren ver. Las cifras One que... is the official Peru, the other is the deep Peru. And these are the official numbers that I gave, but we don't know what the actual numbers are in the amount of people that are infected and are dying. One is the Peru that you see in the, in the media, and the other is the Peru of the mountains, the Peru where people have their houses on the very tops of the mountains where uh, drinking water cannot reach, where they don't have the possibility of washing their hands every few minutes because they don't have water, because there are many people that don't have electricity. There are people that go to the hospitals and are not uh, attended because they are collapsed. There are people waiting in line. There are people dying in the taxis, in their cars, uh, trying to reach a hospital or waiting in line to be attended at a hospital. This is what is happening in Peru today. It is a dramatic situation. It's a terrible situation. And they don't die 
because COVID has attacked with particular ferocity. They die because they are not attended by the health system because what it, because the oxygen the oxygen has uh, raised uh, in its price exponentially and uh, it cannot be paid for anymore by patients that need it and the economy has not stopped either uh, for example the mining industry, which has not stopped exploiting people and the environment for one single second uh, throughout the, the whole pandemic. None of these multinational mining companies has stopped for a single second in exploiting workers and exploiting our lands. So Peru could not uh, come into this crisis because of the pandemic. It was already in crisis. It already had this tremendous inequality because we are a profoundly unequal country. There is a group of 12 families that control all the big businesses, pharmaceutical companies, oil companies. There is a monopoly that has been permitted for many years. This is the Peru from before the pandemic, which already had a social crisis, an economic crisis, which had been worsening since the dictatorship of Fujimori, which is uh, being uh, tried for uh, his crimes, for uh, rapes, for assassinations, for torture, for disappearances. Uh, since then is when this a crisis has been developing that it's on that model that this structure that oppresses and exploits us has been built on this structure. So the presidents have changed, but the roots of this model have been the same since then. This is what we see today. The profiteering of the capitalists uh, not only with health, but also with education. So it is a shame that I have to say that the situation in Peru is so dramatic. But uh, today it is a privilege to receive education in Peru. A high proportion of Peruvians do not have access to internet like, uh, like I do here with an internet connection, with a computer, uh, a camera. There are many people who don't have any of these things, who don't have a television, who may not even have a radio. There are kids who live in the mountain villages who have to walk kilometers with a, a radio trying to find a radio signal to try to get through that radio signal their classes. So there is no access to education for majority. So these versions of education online or through the television or radio, uh, how are you going to access it if you don't have a television or a radio or a computer? So this is what the situation is. And our, our ruling class knows very well that our education system is pauperized. So we need to question uh, the entire system, not just the government or neoliberalism, but capitalism itself. This system that is made to work for the interests of the capitalist class, 70% of the working class, 
70% of uh, our working class in Peru works in the informal section. Getting up at five in the morning to sell some sandwiches or sweets somewhere, somewhere in the street. Well, 70% of our working class uh, earns their daily bread in this way. So what the new cabinet that has assumed now is saying is we need to have the economy advance because the economy has advanced in the last few years and this is false. This is a humongous lie that the media feeds us and that goes against the um, common knowledge that this system is not working because the economic growth they're talking about is not a growth in jobs, it's not a growth in uh, people's resources, it is only a growth in, uh, in profits of their businesses. But the people, the working class, the youth, has not seen an improvement in their living conditions. Here, there's supposed to be a trickle-down economy in which most of the people will get the crumbs that fall off the table, but this doesn't even happen. And so there are these plans to supposedly reactivate the economy with stimulus plans with 28 million solas, but how much of this stimulus package has reached the uh, working people or the or the smaller businesses that struggle to survive. So 71% of the stimulus package has gone to the big businesses. And most people have not received any of this money because they've turned this back on us. And what I want to denounce publicly and is that they have begun a strong policy of a criminalization of protests. A youth of 17 years has been gunned down for protesting, for defending the right for the protesting, demanding that a mining company give a bonus to the people there. I will close with this example. The government wants to reactivate mining to reactivate the economy and they want to increase the amount of mining projects in a valley that in, that in which 24,000 people have jobs today, many young people. And when they demanded from the mining company a, a bonus a, for the pandemic, a, they were responded with repression. So I finish with this. It is necessary to unite to struggle against capitalism because capitalism is the root of all the problems of homophobia, of sexism, of racism, of, of hunger and misery, all our situation. So we need to turn everything over. And for this, we count on you, brothers and sister, comrades, down with, uh, down with capitalism. Now we will hear from uh, Chaya from the Western Sahara. And after that, we will go to closing statements. Hello, everyone. Hello, comrades. I am very excited to be here in this platform and even happier because now I can be live with you. There are many issues. There is a wide uh, report 
uh, everyone is suffering in the whole world or from capitalism, from the pandemic. Uh, capitalism is just another pandemic. Uh, talking about Western Sahara in regards of education and workers or work in general, they're quite connected because as you know, we are, we have been refugees for many years. We're in a war, we're out of our country due to colonialism, occupation, in English occupation. But we are going to focus today on education. We are students. Um, normally when you study, you end your studies, you finish it and then you work. But here in camps, refugee camps, uh, that doesn't happen. People live off donations. There are countries who donate and give in financial aid and food, but those donations are uh, being reduced year by year. And this country has uh, rich resources and sustainable energy sources we don't have access to those resources because they are being exploited by the European Union and other countries in collaboration with Marruecos. So we are uh, sick of this and the youth don't, doesn't want to live like this anymore. Even if there are aids or donations, they don't want to live off donations. They want to work. They want to be open to the world. They are open to what's happening in the whole world. They want to be normal. They want to be regular. They want a job and a future. So this is a normal to be more than 40 years studying and waiting for donation. This is not life anymore. Uh, people don't want this anymore. They want their, their own future and to work on their own fields. And they don't want to see their surroundings exploited from other countries. They make us live like this from these donations that are lesser each time. The occupied zones are even worse because uh, people don't have even rights. Uh, that part of Marruecos, those citizens, um, should have the same rights as regular citizens, but that's not uh, the situation. They don't have a right to a job, to get out, to study. So now in the pandemic, uh, this situation is worse. Not even the Marroqui citizens are living well because there is a high percentage of poverty. Education in this situation of a pandemic, it's even worse. The most important thing, and I have said this before, the most important thing of our fight is for education, because that is the basis of this fight. It is the most important thing. Uh, for uh, Around the year, education is uh, taken care of. Uh, students uh, make great efforts in camps, refugee camps. We have uh, schools, like primary school, and then you have to go to another country to study in university or high school. So it is very important for us. Uh, what happens in the, with this pandemic, we are in a remote zone, um, far from civilization, less culture, less uh, connection, less technology. They have tried to teach lessons from with the technology, but we don't have a, a good connection. But our closest city, you cannot go to the closest city because there are regional borders. It was not possible uh, to go through those borders. So now we've been half a year without studying and that is a huge setback. Uh, that's a setback of a whole year in our program primary schools and elementary schools and, and students to suffer from this setback. We are suffering um, so much and now it's even worse because camps were the only place in which there were not uh, coronavirus cases and now we have four cases and we don't know what's going to happen. 
in this camp, we don't have um, the tools to protect ourselves. So we don't know how to overcome this situation. We will, as we have overcome uh, other situations. But I call for many organizations and people who are willing to help us, who are willing to keep on this path to help uh, human rights to be respected and exercised and to include this fight in your own uh, fights. No one knows what's happening in camps. We are suffering so much, uh, even more in this uh, pandemic situation, uh, even in the work uh, field. The youth is frustrated. We need a change. We need the world to stop exploiting ourselves and our, resor our resources. Uh, those donations come from our own wealth. That is to say that they are giving me part of my own money, the money they made exploiting us and our resources. I don't want to keep going on this because I, I won't stop if I if I get inspired. I really hope uh, the, the comrades who don't know about the situation in the Western Sahara can ask me um, to know more about this issue. The colonialism is a great issue. Um, and people think that coloni colonization is not uh, present here in the 2020, but it is. I'm very happy to be here and I thank you all. Thank you, Chaya. And so we are now, now finishing our last comrade from Ukraine. Ukraine. Hola, hola a todos. Uh, disculpe mi español no muy bien, pero... Um, I'm sorry for my Spanish, but... Yo voy uh, a hablar inglés. Gracias. Uh, I will speak in English. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear participants of the conference. My name is Andre. I am a resident of the Ukrainian Citizens League. Let me give a brief overview of the political orientation and problems in Ukraine that is working class in our country in space. One of the main problems of working class in Ukraine is the low self conscience of the working class itself. In Ukraine, the proletariat is not homogeneous. A worker can sell his labor capital and at the same time run his own small business in absentia. In our country, strong pretty bourgeois views. It is clear that uh, this is a result of the objective condition in which people live and how the ruling class imposes its ideology. As Leon Trotsky said, the bourgeois regime could not hold over the weak and the violence alone. He needs the comment of the morality and ideology. The production of the cement is a profession of the petty bourgeois, theoreticals, and the moralists. They play with all the colors of the rainbow, but it's the less analysis remained of the apostles of the slavery and some visions. This is exactly what of the government, which expresses the interest of the ruling bourgeoisie now. It's doing it uh, flirting with right-wing uh, uh, radicalism. This means for us Marxists to give them resistance to the form the alienation and the propaganda to the proletarian movement. We also have a big problem with the mass immigration of the people, especially young people, to the countries of Western Europe. It's searching of the best high-paying job where in Ukraine, do and put it all, all over and collapse it industrial economy, it cannot be found. In Western Europe, uh, there is not cotton labor from less developed countries which uh, sells its own additional work. Ukraine is not ex expatient. Of course, we know. Um, what uh, I want to say next. 
at personality, I got uh, acquainted with the work uh, process of the Škoda car planet located in the Czech Republic, Škoda out of Pocini, where people from Eastern Europe countries work 16 hours a day, while Czech workers work 80 hours a day and receive the same payment or maybe earn more. It hurts to release it when you release it once open time in 1917, people gave their leave for reduced working day. But what can I say? This exploitation of people from economically powered countries, more developed countries, is a constant result of the capital of 21st century. Our country, to great extent, is a agrarian in our country. We have good land, it gives great and good products, but because of uh, treasure, treasures of bourgeoisie power, his shadow flowers uh, of export products, people do not feel the wealth of our country. Recently, Ukrainian bourgeoisie politicals passed a law leading mortaimund on agricultural land. This law will allow the big bourgeoisie represented by agricultural holdings to provide these people land plots for added value. This was done in favor of the International Monetary Fund, of course, which dictates the political of Ukraine, and Ukrainian bourgeoisie's government is subordinate to it. In other words, Ukraine is a resource feed for other bourgeoisie countries. Of course, all this, all this lead of the accumulations for capitalist contradictions, which will find a way out in the form of social change in the proletarian revolution. The elected history does not stand still, but due to the virus pandemic, those contradictions are getting closer. What we see now in the United States just amazed, truly, is the uh, social revolution really wins in the center of the imperial system. In the United States, it will change everything. It is it change balance of power. It will change the in situation in Ukraine. It will change the world for all of us. Vivamos el socialismo. Muchas gracias.